accidental is in the way? Or I moved it out. No, nope, uh, it's all set. OK, great. Um, well, thank you very much for inviting me to participate today. I'm looking forward to talking to the group about allergic reactions to foods, how to make the diagnosis, and how they're treated. Um, these are my disclosures. Uh, these are basically honoraria for talks that I've given, and uh, none of them will uh, affect the talk that we're going to have today. And these are our learning objectives. Uh, we'll be discussing how to distinguish IgE-mediated food allergy from other forms of food allergy and food intolerance. We'll be talking about the important aspects of the history that are required for evaluating patients with adverse reactions to foods, as well as the use and interpretation of skin testing and laboratory testing in the evaluation. <clears throat> in addition, we'll review the acute and long-term management of a food allergic patient. So we're going to talk about definitions first, because that's oftentimes where people get confused. Uh, one has one definition, the other has another definition, and they both think they're talking about food allergy, but one's talking about something else, and that often leads to confusion. So any unpleasant reaction that occurs after food ingestion is called an adverse reaction to a food. Uh, before we talk about how that's broken down into food allergy and food intolerance, for example, I want to bring up the topic of food aversion, because we see a number of small children who avoid uh, particular foods, and oftentimes that's ascribed to behavior when actually there's often another cause. Because when you think about it, it's really not natural for a young child to want to eat. Um, and so one of the causes of food aversion is food allergy. Some children, when they eat a food, develop oropharyngeal tingling and burning, or a metallic taste, or a hot taste in their mouth, hot spicy taste. And they remember the last time that happened. Uh, it didn't go so well, so they try to avoid the food. An example would be an infant who's given a small amount of egg, eats the egg, develops oropharyngeal tingling and burning, takes one bite, and doesn't want any more. Oftentimes, then the parents you know, think, well, you know, this is good for you. You need to eat more, give them more egg. And then as the child ingests a larger dose, they go on to have a more systemic allergic reaction. So we need to think about food allergy in kids who avoid food as a potential cause. The other potential cause is swallowing difficulties. Some children, if they swallow, uh, denser foods are not sure exactly where it's going to go, so they'll avoid uh, foods of a certain texture. We also have kids who uh, aspirate thin liquids uh, and cough and choke every time they eat, uh, but it's or every time they drink. Uh, but uh, getting enough liquids is a strong enough stimulus that those kids will continue to drink thin liquids and have problems. Uh, but the kids who have difficulty with solid foods, swallowing solid foods, because they don't know where they're going to go, if they're going to go into their airway or their esophagus when they eat them, uh, will avoid solid foods and stick to things that they can drink. And then there are children who have esophagitis. And it can be peptic esophagitis related to reflux and acid injury of the esophagus. Or it can be eosinophilic esophagitis, where they have an allergic reaction in the lining of the esophagus. And when you distend uh, these an esophagus with either peptic esophagitis or eosinophilic esophagitis, it leads to pain. So these are children who like to drink liquids or eat soft foods or meltables, but don't like to eat denser foods. Uh, and there are a number of other features uh, of eating that these children exhibit, uh, but oftentimes they have food aversion. Then there's a child who has oral tactile defensiveness and uh, over-perceives certain sensations, and it's very uncomfortable for them. And then you have the child who actually does have behavioral issues around eating certain foods and just doesn't like certain tastes or textures unrelated to oral tactile defensiveness. So the point is the child who's not eating foods or avoiding certain foods, before you ascribe it to behavior, you want to think about other potential causes of which food allergy is one. So we go on to break adverse reactions to foods down into food allergy or food intolerance, depending upon whether the immune system plays a role in triggering the reaction. <clears throat> um, if the immune system isn't involved, it's called a food intolerance. And these are examples on the right. Uh, there are toxic reactions. For example, if you like to collect your own mushrooms and you get the wrong one, you may have an unpleasant experience from toxins in certain mushrooms. Um, a number of us are lactose intolerant because we don't have enough lactase to digest lactose, which is the milk sugar. Uh, and if you ingest a large amount of milk sugar, drink a large amount of milk, and don't have enough lactase, then you develop abdominal cramping and nausea uh, relatively soon afterwards. That's an example, again, of a metabolic reaction. There are pharmacologic reactions to foods. For example, some people, if they drink too much coffee, the caffeine makes it difficult for them to sleep. When I drink too much coffee, it makes me talk faster. I've just had a cup of coffee, so I need to be aware of that. And then there are in idiosyncratic reactions, meaning we don't understand the mechanism. And then there are other forms of food intolerance as well that uh, 
we won't go into today. And then there are those reactions to foods where the immune system plays a role, and uh, there are IgE-mediated reactions where the allergy antibody is involved, or non-IgE-mediated reactions. We'll talk more about those. You can have both Ig and non-IgE-mediated reactions, and you can have cell-mediated reactions, um, such as celiac disease, for example. Now, if we start first with non-IgE-mediated food allergy, the majority of the symptoms associated with these types of food allergy are gastrointestinal in origin, and there are several different types listed here. Uh, the one in the middle of the page, uh, food protein-induced enterocolitis syndrome, uh, again, what that means is that the reaction occurs uh, in the small intestine in the colon. And uh, food protein-induced enterocolitis syndrome, or FPIES as it's called, is interesting because it's often a delayed reaction. So the child ingests the food and about two to four hours later usually starts to vomit and then vomits repetitively and then goes on to develop diarrhea. About 15% of these patients go on to develop hypotension uh, because of fluid loss. Um, and there's two forms of this disorder. One is the acute form, where the patient isn't eating the food on a regular basis and is given the food and then reacts. Uh, the other is uh, when the food is given chronically, like milk or soy. Uh, and these children vomit on a regular basis, have poor appetite, have diarrhea, fail to thrive, and when you remove the food from their diet, uh, they improve within 72 hours and do much better. Um, the more common foods that cause this are milk and soy regard to liquids, and rice is the most common solid food, and it occurs oftentimes in infants. And so um, it's unfortunate, but sometimes the first food a child is fit is rice cereal, and if they have food protein-induced enterocolitis syndrome to rice cereal, they can have reactions uh, with the first or second exposure. Uh, and then there's food protein-induced proctocolitis or allergic proctocolitis. This is something we see in pediatrics a lot where, uh, in a number of these children interestingly enough, are breastfed, and the small amount of cow's milk protein or soy that makes its way into breast milk um, can travel all the way to the colon uh, and cause uh, gross blood in the stool. These children, if you remove the food from the diet, uh, they recover again within 72 hours, and oftentimes they outgrow it within the first couple of years of life. Uh, FPIs that I talked to you about previously uh, is usually outgrown between the third and fifth year of life, although there's some kids where it persists longer. And then, of course, there are other disorders like celiac disease um, that you can see as well where patients have chronic diarrhea and malabsorption and abdominal pain because of exposure to gluten. Um, then there are mixed disorders, um, and the most common mixed disorder involving Ig and non-Ig mediated mechanisms are the eosinophilic uh, gastrointestinal disorders. We're seeing now a lot of eosinophilic esophagitis. Um, and this is where, again, you have an allergic reaction in the lining of the esophagus. It leads to increased numbers of eosinophils. These patients present with different symptoms depending upon age. Uh, in infants, it presents with food aversion or food intolerance and failure to thrive with vomiting. Uh, they often vomit when they eat or cough or choke when they eat. As they get older and can tell you, can verbalize what they're feeling, uh, they may complain of epigastric pain or chest pain or trouble swallowing. And again, uh, they're very good at accommodating uh, to the difficulty swallowing. So they have several behaviors. They tend to uh, avoid denser foods. They take small bites of foods. They put sauces on their food, chew their food for long periods of time. So it takes them longer to eat than other children. Uh, they may cough or choke when they eat anyway. And they drink larger amounts of liquids with meals than other children. So those are kind of the, the feeding behaviors you see in this group. And sometimes they present with food impaction, where they swallow a denser food, uh, such as a meat or sometimes even rice, and the food sticks and won't go up or down, and they present to the emergency room and have to have it removed. Um, so you'll hear about uh, eosinophilic esophagitis. And in fact, uh, we do see children on the autism spectrum who have eosinophilic esophagitis. Um, when we talk about mechanisms, immunologic mechanisms, I uh, Classical food allergy is an IgE-mediated reaction. So patients who are allergic make more allergy antibody or IgE antibody than people who are not allergic. And again, in, in this slide, you can see uh, the IgE antibody here. It has two arms. And this particular part is the same on each arm of the IgE molecule. <clears throat> and it recognizes six to eight amino acids on a protein. So when someone becomes allergic, they get, get exposed to the food. 
uh, they have a tendency to become allergic. It may be the way they were exposed to the food. For example, we think some children with eczema get exposed and become allergic by exposure through the skin. So peanut protein in the form of peanut butter may be placed on their skin. It penetrates into the skin and the body thinks it's a, a foreign invader. And so it then makes an IgE antibody directed against the peanut protein or amino acids on uh, some of the allergens in peanut protein. Once this specific antibody is made, it circulates through the bloodstream and binds to high affinity receptors on the surface of the mast cell. Now, mast cells are cells that we have throughout the body. They're increased numbers where we come into contact with the environment. And this is a particularly interesting cell. It's where we store histamine. And it can also generate a number of other mediators that can lead uh, to the symptoms of an allergic reaction. So once the IgE specific for a particular allergen is on the surface of the mast cell and the patient is re-exposed, uh, then two IgE molecules bind to the allergen. This brings the receptors close together. That activates the mast cell. It thinks there is a foreign invader. And it pumps out uh, the granule contents that contain histamine and proteases and heparin. And then it generates these other mediators uh, relatively quickly that can call in other cells and cause uh, local reactions. And then over time, uh, it secretes other cytokines that are capable of call, calling in other cells, such as eosinophils, for example. And the symptoms that result from this, uh, if we talk about the scanner, are the ones we tend to think about with allergic reactions, flushing hives, uh, deep tissue swelling, or eczema. In the mouth, you get oropharyngeal itching, uh, swelling. You may get abdominal cramping, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, uh, sneezing. Uh, swelling in the throat, wheezing, coughing, shortness of breath. And in severe cases, um, you can go on to develop hypotension. Um, you, you can lose up to 50% of your intravascular volume over the first 10 minutes of an in, of a anaphylactic reaction. So some of these reactions progress rapidly. Um, neurologically, you may see loss of consciousness, particularly with hypotension. And obviously, as you would expect, irritability often accompanies these reactions, but these patients are uncomfortable. Now, the other um, part of the um, reaction is the allergen. And this is recognized by the allergen-specific IgE. And most allergens are water-soluble glycoproteins. So they're not sugars. They're not fats. They're proteins that have sugar moieties stuck onto them. They have a molecular weight that's small enough that they can be absorbed across membranes. And the majority tend to be resistant to heat and changes in pH and proteases. Uh, which is how you become sensitized. Again, it's hard to become sensitized if the allergen or the protein is denatured quickly, and we'll talk about that more in a minute. Uh, and there, a number of these allergens have been identified and isolated and sequenced and cloned. They are named in the order in which they're discovered, and they have the species in front. And so these are common egg allergens. Uh, the most common egg allergen is ovomucoid. <clears throat> and then these are the common uh, peanut allergens. And now this is up to higher than seven. It's they're more than that. Now, this is uh, a cover of the Journal of Allergy and Clinical Immunology in July of 2003. But what it shows is uh, an, uh, an allergen uh, here in the form of a protein that's folded on itself. So this is just a group of amino acids in a row. Each one of these stars is what we would call an epitope. So that's a six to eight amino acid stretch uh, that an IgE molecule can recognize. And so you can see there are more than 20 epitopes, 21 here, on this particular uh, allergen, and this is just one of the allergens that you would find in peanut. Uh, these epitopes, like I mentioned to you previously, are often six to eight amino acids in length. If they're six amino acids in a row, that's called a sequential or linear epitope. Uh, if they're a conformational epitope, then you have three amino acids from one arm of the protein and perhaps three amino acids to four from another arm of the protein. That's a conformational epitope. That's important because when you heat the protein up, a conformational epitope may separate. Uh, and it's no longer an allergen because the epitope is denatured. But the sequential epitopes uh, remain active. And so we have about 75% 70 of kids who are allergic to milk or egg that can tolerate milk or egg in a baked good that's cooked at 350 degrees for 30 minutes. And that's because these kids are allergic to conformational epitopes that are denatured with cooking. The ones who are allergic to sequential epitopes don't tolerate milk or egg in baked goods. So uh, that's an important clinical feature. Um, it's also important to take the family history, because you're at higher risk if your parents 
or you have a sibling uh, that is allergic. That makes it more likely that you're going to be allergic uh, and food allergic as well. There's also an entity known as the atopic march. So a number of the children we see early in life, oftentimes within the first three months of life, develop eczema or atopic dermatitis. They then go on to become food allergic, although some become food allergic first and then develop atopic dermatitis. Next, they wheeze with viral illness and they become sensitized to animals if there are animals in the environment. Uh, and this can all occur before three years of age. And then between three and five years of age or seven years of age is oftentimes when uh, seasonal allergen sensitization occurs and they go on to develop seasonal allergic rhinitis. If you have allergic rhinitis before three years of age, it's oftentimes to an allergen you're exposed to on a regular basis like dust mite or animal dander, as I mentioned previously. Now, fortunately, drug allergy and insect sting hypersensitivity don't track as well with this. Uh, and this is important because there are a number of parents who think that their child is, who is allergic to other uh, foods or allergens uh, would have a severe reaction with an insect sting, and oftentimes this is not the case. Now, when we think about the diagnostic approach to evaluating a patient with food allergy, I'm not going to go through this whole slide, but we start with a detailed history and physical examination. And at the end of that portion of the evaluation, um, as physicians, we are care practitioners, we think, okay, is this an IgE-mediated reaction, or is it a mixed reaction, or is it a non-IgE-mediated reaction? And that's important because if we think it's IgE-mediated or a mix, then skin testing or measuring allergen-specific IgE will be helpful. If we don't think it's IgE-mediated, then these skin tests uh, will not help us determine the food uh, that's causative. And in taking the history, we focus on which foods are suspected by the patient or their family of causing reactions. Uh, we look at route of exposure. Again, the majority occur uh, with either contact or ingestion. Um, inhalation reactions are rare but can occur. Um, if you're on a plane, for example, and they serve peanuts to everyone in the plane and everybody has um, a little bag of peanuts that's pressurized and opens them at about the same time you can get peanut dust into the air that may affect some of the patients who are exquisitely sensitive to peanuts. Or you may get that peanut protein on the seat and have a contact reaction. Um, but peanut butter <clears throat> doesn't cause reactions by inhalation because the smell of peanut butter doesn't contain any protein. You have to get the protein into the air. So there are children who smell peanut butter and become anxious and are uncomfortable. Uh, but generally they're not having an allergic reaction. I mean, there have been studies uh, where they expose these children uh, within a foot uh, to, you know, and they had immunocaps that were very high in large positive skin tests and no reaction occurred. Um, we also think, well, and the majority of severe reactions to foods, again, occur with ingestion. Contact reactions, you can usually wash the food off. The patient may develop a few urticaria, and if they get it in their eye, they may develop significant ocular swelling. But uh, they, they usually go on to recover quickly. You want to know about the amount ingested that led to the reaction because patients who react to very small amounts uh, are at higher risk of more severe reactions. The manner of preparation of the food is important. Uh, as I talked to you about previously, um, sometimes a patient will tolerate the food if it's cooked but won't tolerate it when it's raw because they're allergic to a conformational epitope. So sometimes that can be helpful if they say they're allergic to a fruit but can tolerate it when it's cooked. That would fit. Uh, then you want to know if the food was, you know, uh, prepared in an unusual way. Did they add spices? Did they mix it with other foods? And we talk about preservatives and dyes a lot, but they're rarely the cause of an IgE-mediated reaction. Um, there is one called carmine that's a red dye that's found in artificial shellfish and uh, yogurts, uh, berry yogurts, and that's made from uh, ground-up insect larvae, and people can develop uh, IgE-mediated reactions to carmine. And the other one is anato, which is a yellow dye, and people can develop IgE-mediated reactions to anato. You want to think about other foods that people ate at the time they had the reaction. Sometimes they focus on the wrong food as the cause. And you want to know if anyone else ate the same food and became ill, because again, it could be a toxic reaction. Um, and then in taking the history, we want to know which of the foods they ate at the meal they've eaten since without a reaction, because that makes it less likely that those were the cause. And then sometimes we find that patients are eating foods they think they're allergic to in significant amounts uh, as an ingredient in another food. So it's important to take a thorough history. There is a condition where you can skin test yourself if you're not allergic uh, to a fresh extract of the food and make the diagnosis, and that's scombrotoxic poisoning. So when they sell tuna, uh, they try to sell it raw as long as they can, 
but uh, if they're getting to the point where it's it's been a long time and they're worried about refrigeration, they cut it into uh, fillets and then snap freeze it. If they waited too long, uh, the fish can be contaminated with proteus, which is a bacteria that can metabolize the histidine in fish muscle to histamine, and it's like eating a large amount of histamine. Uh, you can also make a little extract and skin test yourself, and if you have a positive skin test and you're not known to be allergic to a scomboid fish, then that makes the diagnosis. Now, which are the most common foods that cause food allergy? In young children, it's milk, egg, wheat, soy, uh, peanuts, and tree nuts as they get older and start eating those foods. In a child who's allergic to milk, you need to ask about beef. About 15% of the kids who are milk allergic can't tolerate beef, although 85% can. Of those who don't tolerate beef, there's a portion that can tolerate it if it's well done, but don't tolerate it if it's rare. We're back to denature, denaturing uh, allergens by heating or cooking. Uh, same concept, you need to think about raw egg. There are more kids that are sensitized to raw egg than uh, there are children who are sensitized to cooked egg. Um, and then um, in regard to uh, tree nuts, uh, if you're allergic to peanuts, I'm sorry, if you're allergic to peanuts, you've got about a 35% chance of reacting to a tree nut. If you're allergic to one tree nut, you've got about a 37% chance of reacting to another tree nut. And in regard to outgrowing the food allergy, uh, food allergies to milk, egg, wheat, and soy are more commonly outgrown. Uh, about 10 to 15 percent of kids will outgrow sensitization to uh, peanuts, and tree nuts are infrequently outgrown. The interesting thing about soy is soy is a legume, and there's only about a 5 percent cross-reactivity among legumes. So you may be peanut allergic, uh, but you may be able to tolerate soy, or you may be soy allergic. Uh, but still be able to tolerate peanuts or green beans or other beans, so that's important to know. Since the majority of patients have gross sensitization to milk, egg, uh, wheat, and soy with time, uh, the foods that we see commonly in adolescents and adults as a cause of food allergy are peanuts, tree nuts, fish, and shellfish. Um, there's some interesting uh, correlations here. If you're allergic to pecan, there's a high likelihood you would react to walnut because uh, they're immunologically very sensitive, and if you react to pistachio, it's highly likely you would react to cashew, because again, they're immunologically very similar. Um, oftentimes, if you react to one fin fish, you'll react to another. Um, so oftentimes, avoiding all fish is necessary, but there are some patients who can tolerate some fish and not others. And in regard to shellfish, uh, if you're allergic to one crustacean, it's highly likely that you react to another crustacean, so shrimp, prawn, lobster, crab. If you react to one of those, you're highly likely to react to another one of them, but you might be able to tolerate a mussel or a clam without a problem. The other thing that's important about shellfish allergy is to realize that it doesn't have anything to do with reactions to radio contrast dye. The allergy there is uh, to tropomycin, which is a muscle protein. Um, so there's cross-reactivity between dust mite and shellfish and cockroach and shellfish, but not radiographic contrast dye and shellfish. You can't discount the story based on the food that the patient reports as causing symptoms because there have been a wide variety of foods to which these reactions have been reported. So even if it sounds unusual, you need to follow through and be rigorous in the evaluation. And then um, you want to describe the reactions. Uh, what's the timing of onset in relation to food ingestion? As we mentioned previously, in IgE-mediated reactions to foods, the symptoms start either while the food is being eaten or within the first couple of hours after food ingestion. Uh, you want to know if the symptoms are consistent with those we talked about earlier that would uh, make you think about an IgE-mediated reaction to a food. You'd like to know how severe the reaction was, because if there's a history of a life-threatening or severe reaction, the likelihood of repeating that is high. And you'd like to know the duration of the reaction. Um, again, oftentimes mild to moderate reactions to foods last less than an hour or a couple of hours, which is why a number of patients think that Benadryl or antihistamines help, because they take the antihistamine and they're better. But in, in a number of those situations, they would have been better anyway, even without the antihistamine. I mean, epinephrine is a drug of choice, and we'll talk more about that. Uh, but it's dose-related. So um, if you vomit the food up that you're allergic to, that can be helpful. Not that we encourage people to do that, but vomiting uh, can remove some of the allergen and decrease the, the systemic exposure. There are biphasic reactions where a patient has a significant reaction and then improves and then has a return of symptoms. Uh, thank goodness those are rare, particularly in pediatrics, occurring in only about 3%, uh, but you need to monitor patients for that. Uh, prolonged severe reactions are rare, uh, but they can occur as well. But again, the good news is they're really rare. 
Um, so it's, if you have hives that last for days, or if a child has hives that last for days, it's usually uh, a viral illness or another cause rather than a food allergy uh, that caused that reaction. You want to know about the treatment of the reaction and what the response was. Um, are these reactions reproducible? Because IgE-mediated reactions to foods occur with almost ever, uh, with almost every reaction, unless uh, you know they focused on the wrong food as the cause, or it was cross-contaminated with another food, or the food allergen was denatured by cooking, like we talked about previously, or whether there was a spice that was added to that food, or perhaps another trigger such as exercise is needed, and we'll talk more about that in a minute. You want to know about their most recent reaction because, again, some patients outgrow their reaction, their allergic reactions to foods or their uh, allergy to foods. And what happens is they accidentally ingest the food in some situations and nothing happens, and then they realize that they might have outgrown it. There's also cross-reactivity between some foods and other foods and sometimes pollens in foods. Um, we've talked about legumes. If you're allergic to peanut, your risk of reacting to another legume is about 5%, which can be important if you're looking for protein sources in children. One point I'd like to make is that if you're cow's milk allergic, you've got a 92% chance of reacting to goat's milk because the caseins in cow's milk and goat's milk are very similar versus mare's milk where the caseins are different and they have only a 4% chance. Uh, but unfortunately, mare's milk and camel's milk are not widely available uh, in the store. Um, there are patients who are pollen allergic and cross-react um, with vegetables and fruits. We'll talk more about that in a minute. And latex allergic patients uh, can also have reactions after the ingestion of foods as well. So knowing these cross-reactivities can be helpful. Uh, one of the cross-reactivities is evidenced or manifested by the pollen food allergy syndrome, or it's known as the oral allergy syndrome as well. This is where the patient becomes sensitized by exposure to a pollen rather than by eating the food. So they become pollen allergic, and then because the food contains protein allergens that are similar uh, to those found in the pollen, uh, they develop symptoms upon exposure or upon ingestion of the food. So uh, this is birch pollen, and patients who are birch pollen sensitive often complain of tingling and burning in their mouth or feeling uncomfortable feelings in their throat after the ingestion of a fresh apple, although they can eat cooked apples without a problem, or hazelnuts. And this is a ragweed pollen, and patients who are ragweed allergic oftentimes complain of itching and tingling in their mouth after the ingestion of banana or watermelon. Uh, the good news is these rarely go on to cause systemic anaphylaxis. Usually it's a discomfort in the oropharynx and throat, um, and they can usually tolerate the food if it's cooked. Uh, their symptoms often increase uh, during the pollen season. Then there's food-dependent exercise-induced anaphylaxis. This is where the patient can eat the food and not exercise and tolerate it without a problem, or they can exercise without eating the food and do fine, but when they eat the food and exercise, uh, they have anaphylaxis. Um, and so this, this is oftentimes a patient who's eaten a meal and then gone out to participate in sports and had an anaphylactic event. Uh, it's, it can occur in rare cases with exercise following the ingestion of any meal, not a particular food, but those cases are really rare. And a number of foods have been implicated, uh, fish, shellfish, wheat, celery, fruit, mushrooms. Um, oftentimes it's an adolescent um, or a young adult, and females outnumber males, but can happen to anyone, and we're not sure exactly about the mechanism that's involved. We think it has to do with absorption. Sometimes it's not the food. Uh, this child is eating, so if you walked back in and the dog was in the car, you might think the reaction was to the food, but it could be to dog saliva, for example. Um, so you need to think about other causes of reactions, like viral illness that might lead to urticaria or hives rather than the food medications such as non-steroidal anti-inflammatory medications that can cause hives or angioedema, or perhaps it's something else that was in the food like a toxin or a spice or a dust mite or latex or an antibiotic. Um, you can have other allergen exposure. It can happen during the pollen season. You might think it's the food rather than the pollen, or there may be psychological factors where people uh, are worried that certain foods cause symptoms, uh, and as a result of their concern, they may become nauseated or anxious and have symptoms, hyperventilate, for example and have difficulty breathing. So what about the history alone as a predictor of the severity of the next reaction? Well, it's difficult um, to work out because there are a number of different factors uh, that uh, play a role. There are patient-related factors. Uh, patients with asthma tend to have more severe allergic reactions to foods. Patients who are on medications that interfere with the treatment of allergic reactions to foods have more severe reactions. So if a child has migraine headaches and has been placed on a beta blocker, they might have a more severe reaction. 
Uh, some foods are more often associated with severe reactions, like peanuts and tree nuts or fish or shellfish. And so it depends upon the level of sensitivity of the patient. So what's been their what's their target organ? Is it their skin? That's uncomfortable but not life threatening, or is it their lung, or their vascular system where they develop rapid onset hypotension? Those can be life threatening. So the things that kill you during during an anaphylactic reaction are either hypotension uh, that's immediate and onset, because again, as I mentioned, you can lose 50% of your intravascular volume over the first 10 minutes of an anaphylactic reaction, or you have laryngeal edema, swelling in your throat to the point that you can't breathe, or you develop a severe asthma-like reaction. Um, where you get bronchoconstriction and you can't breathe and, and you die. <clears throat> Those are the most three, are uh, the three most common causes of death in an allergic reaction uh, to a food. Uh, there can also be psychosocial issues or maturity issues. So it's one thing if you have symptoms and immediately tell an adult. It's another if you're worried that you're going to get a shot of epinephrine, so you run and hide when you have the reaction rather than get help. And then there are event factors such as which food, how, what the contact was like, was it through the skin, or did you eat it, or you, did you inhale it? Was it injected? Um, what's the dose, and what's the, you know, the biologic dose? What's the systemic exposure? Uh, again, target organ, like I mentioned previously, uh, was treatment provided quickly, and did the patient respond to treatment? All these factors go into uh, <clears throat> determining the severity of each reaction. And because dose can vary from exposure to exposure, that's why it's hard to predict the severity of subsequent reactions. It's not where each time you're exposed you have a more severe reaction. That's not the case. So um, when we look at risk factors for fatality, um, this is a study done by Alan Bach and following studies have kind of borne out the same issues. Um, a lot of these reactions are related to peanuts or tree nuts, although they can certainly occur to other foods. Uh, sexes are equally affected, although you tend to have more young boys who are food allergic. It becomes equivalent uh, male-female around uh, adolescence and puberty, and then as we age, more women appear to be food allergic than men, which is interesting. But most of these patients were adolescents or young adults that saw to be attributed to um, uh, lack of, uh, well, risk-taking behavior would be uh, the term. And all but one knew that they were allergic to the food that caused their fatal reaction. Most of these occurred outside the home uh, where they weren't in their usual environment. Asthmatics are at higher risk of uh, fatalities from food-induced anaphylaxis as they are from any form of anaphylaxis. And a number of these patients didn't have their epinephrine with them, their injectable epinephrine with them, although four did and still uh, died. And, and that can happen particularly if you delay um, using um, injectable epinephrine during a severe reaction. So what's the summary here? Well, the history correlates poorly with the outcome of food challenges. That's if you take all takers. So if you just take the population in general and ask them if they're food allergic, about two-thirds of the people who say they're allergic will have a reproducible, I'm sorry, will not reproduce their reactions on food challenge, about a third will. But there are certain features of the history that make it more likely that they do have IgE-mediated food allergy. And that's the things we talked about, family and personal history of allergic disease, uh, rapid onset of symptoms, the symptoms consistent with um, allergic reactions and then reproducible reactions. All those things would make you think, oh, this is probably a food allergic patient. Um, the history is an unreliable predictor of severity of subsequent reactions. Um, there are patients who have mild reactions initially uh, on exposure to peanut that with subsequent exposure is going to have more severe reactions and that can be related to dose or increase in sensitization. Uh, asthmatics are at higher risk. People who've had a previous severe reaction are at higher risk of repeating life-threatening reactions. And we talked about risk of adolescence and young adults because of risk-taking behaviors. The history can also be helpful in helping you decide when a patient may have outgrown their food allergy. So if they had a recent significant exposure uh, without a reaction, then it might be worth uh, further evaluation. So after we take the history, we examine the patient. And we're looking for other symptoms that are often associated with IgE-mediated allergies. So we look for nasal obstruction, nasal congestion, the thin, clear secretions that go along with allergic reactions to foods, the transverse nasal crease in the child who rubs their nose frequently by performing the allergic salute, the dark circles under the eyes that's associated with nasal congestion. Uh, this is a woman who's a sous chef and is allergic to carrots. She was peeling carrots, forgot to wash her hands, and touched her eye and developed angioedema of her eyelid and some, you can see the ocular involvement here. This is a patient who has Denny's lines or Denny-Morgan folds, these lines here uh, underneath the eyelid because of periocular edema. 
Um, and then these are findings associated with eczema. And kids with eczema have a decreased uh, cellular immunity in their skin, and they tend to get molluscum contagiosum warts more, and that's what you're looking at there. So we look for these features uh, because, again, uh, children who have food allergy, IgE-mediated food allergy, oftentimes have these other uh, findings uh, that go along with allergic disease. Once we have a history that's suggestive, we document sensitization by either skin testing with commercial or fresh extracts of foods, or we might check for allergen-specific IgE in the blood. In certain situations, past testing may be helpful. Uh, but not that frequently. These are the common things we pursue. Some patients need food challenges. Um, some go on elimination diets. In certain situations, we need to look for um, gastroesophageal reflux disease or may need to take a look at the tissue and see, for example, if they have eosinophilic esophagitis. And there are a host of other consultants that we as allergists work with, such as dietitians and gastroenterologists, feeding therapists, and psychosocial clinicians. Now, in working up patients, it's important to realize that sensitization is not the same as allergy. There are a number of people who have a positive skin test to a food or have a positive allergen-specific Ig in the bloodstream uh, that uh, do not react on exposure to the food. So you don't remove the food from the diet uh, if they don't have symptoms with ingestion but only have a positive skin test. So the skin test and the blood test will overestimate prevalence of food allergy. It's allergy if you have sensitization, and then you have symptoms on exposure. This is the way skin tests are performed. Uh, we have a small drop of the allergen. This uh, is placed uh, into the allergen solution, and the skin is pricked. Um, the allergen finds its way into the tissue. It combines with IgE on the surface of the mast cell. The mast cell then releases all its mediators, and you get uh, vasodilation, which causes the redness that you see here, right here. Um, this is an axon reflex here that you're seeing. Um, and then you get swelling because of leakage of uh, uh, plasma fluid and protein into the skin. So this is a patient <clears throat> with uh, a positive skin test to milk. You can see what we call the wheel here. And this is the erythema or redness that surrounds it. That's a large positive skin test to milk. In every patient that is skin tested, you place a positive control, which is histamine, and a negative control, which is saline. This shows that they aren't on an antihistamine that will block uh, reactions. And a lack of reaction to saline uh, is obviously normal. If they react to the saline, you worry about pressure-sensitive skin. So we tend to buy extracts uh, that we use commercially. Uh, they're 1 to 10 or 1 to 20 weight to volume. We prepare fresh extracts to fruits and vegetables because they auto-degrade. And sometimes commercial extracts to foods are not as reliable for fruits and vegetables. Uh, we use the prick technique, not the intradermal technique. It's not necessary and carries a higher likelihood of significant reaction. Um, and again, systemic reactions to epicutaneous skin testing is rare. It can occur, but it's really rare. The positive predictive accuracy of a skin test isn't great. Uh, so there are a number of people who have a positive skin test but can tolerate the food without a problem. But the negative predictive accuracy is often very good. So fewer than 5% of the people who have a negative skin test are going to react on exposure. And skin testing uh, is, is decided upon based upon the history and major food allergens that are known to cause symptoms. Again, um, we sometimes have patients bring in the fresh food. Um, we have them put it in a Ziploc freezer bag, uh, crush it up, and then uh, use the fluid or add saline, use that fluid for skin testing. We do that if we don't have a commercial extract. Let's say they reacted to a gummy bear or a candy. We don't have that particular extract. We can make it up. Um, we talked about fruits and vegetables because it's more reliable because they auto-degrade. <clears throat> Sometimes we use it uh, if they're at a restaurant and have a restaurant meal. They'll bring in the whole meal and we'll crush different aspects up of the meal and make a skin test and see if we can uh, determine which ingredient caused it. Again, this is not a standardized uh, technique, uh, but skin testing overall is not standardized either. So uh, if we look at the guidelines for the diagnosis and management of food allergy in the U.S., it was recently uh, published. Uh, in regard to skin testing, uh, pre skin testing, they report, uh, they agree that it's safe and helpful for the diagnosis of IgE-mediated food allergy, that the reagents and methods aren't standardized, that you don't do intradermal testing. Uh, the positive skin test tells you that they have allergen-specific IgE directed to that food on the surface of a cutaneous mast cell. You're using their body as a bioassay. And then um, when you compare it to oral food challenges, we said before, you're going to have a lot of people who have a positive skin test, uh, but, but may have a negative oral food challenge. But the larger the size of the wheel, uh, the more likely that the food allergen 
is uh, clinically relevant. And as I mentioned previously, when you're looking at patients who have oral allergy syndrome, uh, where you don't have commercial extracts, uh, you might skin test into the native food, like the fruit and vegetable. And if you have a negative skin test in the face of a highly suggestive history, um, first of all, we repeat the skin test, or we use a fresh extract of the food to skin test. And if those are still negative, then we consider a medically supervised challenge. If the history is highly suggestive, you don't have them go home and eat the food at home and call you back if they have a reaction. Now, the other thing that people have tried to use uh, to uh, diagnose food allergy is allergen-specific IgE circulating in the bloodstream. And though those are the tests for those are called immunocaps. Um, Dr. Sampson and his group challenged a large number of children with food allergy to different foods and developed uh, these uh, distinguishing points. Uh, and you can see for the major allergens, and again, we don't have them to every food, it's to the major allergens. You can appreciate here that the numbers differ. So if you're over two years of age, if your immunocap to egg is seven or higher, you've got a 98% positive, you know, it's a 98% positive predicted value. Uh, if you're less than two years of age, two gives you a 95% uh, likelihood. For milk, it's 15. For peanut, it's 14. Fish, it's 20. And again, another point to make here is that if you look at this, even at less than 0 0.35 to peanut, if you go at probability of reacting, you still have a 20 to 30% chance. So someone with a history of peanut allergy and a negative, a negative immunocap uh, could still potentially react. The next step here is to skin test them and then, if, and then, if necessary, do a food challenge. So what about immunocaps? Well, again, they're useful for the diagnosis of IgE-mediated food allergy, but they're not diagnostic in and of themselves, just like the skin test. Uh, they've just determined the cutoff levels uh, for predictive values, and, and uh, they're similar to those of skin tests, although overall the skin test, in my opinion, is a bit more sensitive than the immunocap. Um, the different assays yield variable results. So the data that was presented previously was um, obtained using an immunocap. If you use a different assay system, you might get a different number. Uh, and uh, the absolute levels of specific IgE may directly correlate with the likelihood of clinical reactivity when compared with oral food challenges. Again, um, the larger the value, the more likely uh, you are to react on exposure. And it's the same thing here. If you have a negative uh, immunocap, but a very suggestive history, the next step would be to either skin test or uh, perhaps perform a, a medically supervised food challenge. Now, if you consider the patient to be allergic to a particular food, obviously you take it out of their diet. If their symptoms persist and it makes you think there are other foods that are causing symptoms, um, so there are also patients where they're not certain which food is causing their reaction, and so we use different diets to help us uh, determine whether uh, certain foods cause symptoms. So there's a limited elimination diet where you just remove high suspicion foods or those to which they have a positive skin test or immunocap. There are oligoantigenic diets where you remove foods that are common food allergens. They may be on a couple of fruits, a couple of vegetables, a couple of grains, a couple of meats. Um, for example, a lamb and rice diet is often used. Or there are elemental formulas where everything is broken down into its smallest component. So the sugars are carbohydrates, the proteins are amino acids, and so they're not big enough for the IgE molecule to bind to. The problem with those is the more you break down a food, the less tasty it is. <clears throat> and so they have a, um, a smell that's less than pleasant, and the taste is, takes some getting used to. So it's hard. Uh, above infancy or early childhood to get kids to drink too much of this. You need to think about how to do it. In some situations, it's necessary to perform a medically supervised food challenge. Um, this is a patient of mine who's now about twice as old as he was here, and I'd known him since he was born, and I think you can appreciate he's about to eat a pistachio. He has a negative skin test, a negative immunocap, and he's still concerned that he might have a reaction that is giving me that look. So these, these kids are incredibly brave when they uh, participate in these food challenges. Um, and I think this illustrates the anxiety that goes along with food challenge, uh, which he tolerated this, by the way, without any problem. But uh, sometimes you have to give uh, people the food to see if indeed they're truly allergic, or you may challenge them to see if they've outgrown their sensitization. This should be done by people who are well acquainted with the technique. Uh, you know, we give the food oftentimes down in open fashion, although if it's done for research, oftentimes the studies are double-blind, placebo-controlled. That's considered to be uh, the gold standard. But you have to have enough medical support 
and you have to decide what your question is you want to have answered. You, know, you select the initial dose and then gradually in, give them increasing doses of the food. Um, and the time intervals may be from 20 to 30 minutes to an hour after ingestion. It's related to their reaction. And their initial dose is based upon you know, what dose they reacted to. And the goal is oftentimes to document whether they're sensitive or whether they're not sensitive to a particular food. These are safe uh, when done by uh, people who have experience in doing them. Um, and the false negative rate is low. It's less than 3%. The false positive rate is less than 1% as well. So uh, they can be very helpful in making the correct diagnosis. When patients uh, have reactions, uh, we need to make sure that we take the time to help them understand how to recognize uh, the early signs and symptoms of an allergic reaction, the symptoms we talked about previously. Um, and when to use uh, injectable epinephrine. And again, if they have two organ system involvement, like the skin is involved along with the GI tract, and you're not in a medical setting, uh, that's enough uh, to use an EpiPen or an injectable uh, epinephrine device. Uh, again, this is, you know, we also need to help patients understand that this is safe to use. It's not going to make them worse, and it's oftentimes uh, life-saving. Uh, if anything, uh, people hesitate to use their auto-injectable epinephrine device uh, when they should. Uh, if you give them an antihistamine, you want that to be a liquid or chewable antihistamine so it's more rapidly absorbed, and then they should take an ambulance to the emergency room. I'm not trying to promote EpiPens here. I just wanted to show you the mechanism, which uh, is a spring uh, that is hooked to a plunger, and then this is the size of the needle. So basically what they're doing is they pull this out and uh, and then when they press this against their leg, it, it, uh, this particular device moves up and then slips out, and then the spring takes over. It has 100 pounds of pressure and will inject the medication into the muscle. Everyone who's food allergic needs an anaphylaxis action plan. This you know, has demographic information and then has symptoms and what to do with different symptoms, when to use the epi uh, epinephrine device, uh, when to give an antihistamine, uh, the dosage that can be used, and then who to call. Uh, and so this is important, particularly for kids in, in different uh, care situations. When they arrive in the emergency room, the, the personnel there are going to assess them rapidly and get oxygen on if they need it. They're going to repeat epinephrine if they need it. They're going to make sure they get IV fluids. And then if they're wheezing, they may get a bronchodilator. The steroids may be helpful, but again, delayed onset of action. This is more for inflammation that occurs later. Um, they pay attention to factors that might inhibit response to epinephrine, like the beta blocker we talked about. They watch the patients for relapses, and people shouldn't leave their doctor's office or the emergency room without a prescription for an auto-injectable epinephrine device, and then they need follow-up care. This is a child who's just received an EpiPen, and you can see the site. You can also appreciate that epinephrine is a vasoconstrictor because you've got all this erythema around, and this is where the epinephrine has <clears throat> gone into the skin and, and led to vasoconstriction. Um, the follow-up visit is after, you know, you make sure they have a follow-up visit after they have an allergic reaction because you want to monitor their response to treatment. Um, how did they get into the food? How did it happen? Was it an accident um, or not? And then you want to review the effectiveness of the food allergy action plan and make necessary alterations and also provide emotional support. Patients often become much more anxious after they have these reactions. They do well for a while without reactions, think they have it under control and have a reaction. And this is obviously very concerning. So it's nice to uh, make sure you, uh, you know, see how they tolerate it from an emotional standpoint as well. And then the long-term management involves follow-up visits at appropriate intervals. Uh, again, how often are they having reactions? What are those specifics? Are they just having contact reactions? Are they having more severe reactions? Uh, have they had exposure to an offending food without a reaction? Are they outgrowing their sensitization? What's their diet like now? Does it meet their nutritional requirements? <clears throat> have they developed allergies to other foods? Are they carrying their medications? What's the impact of food allergy on the quality of life? Are they being bullied? Are they afraid to eat in public? Or have they developed other allergic disease like asthma that may even put them at higher risk for their allergic reactions to foods? You want to make sure that they're gaining weight <clears throat> and that they aren't wheezing or don't have other evidence of allergic disease on physical exam. And then they may need skin testing repeated or performed, or they may need immunocaps repeated or other testing may be suggested by the history, for example, a food challenge if the child uh, look, has had ingested a food they were thought to be allergic to but didn't react. And then we need to reinforce long-term that uh, they carry their medications at all times uh, as well as their action plan. Uh, 
we have to decide when a food challenge is indicated by history or laboratory results. Uh, we have to help in the interactions with the school and the community that may not understand allergic reactions to foods, although uh, the awareness is much better than it ever has been before. Um, answer any questions the patient has. Uh, we may need to make suggestions regarding uh, impact on quality of life and think about whether you know the patient needs to be seen by an allergist or a gastroenterologist or they need a dietitian or a psychosocial clinician. And then as allergists we can help uh, in the patient who has uh, severe persistent disease or multiple food allergies or complications of allergies or coexisting aller allergic disease. And again, it's often best to have these patients seen by an allergist because they have a number of questions uh, about exposure and, and uh, you know, different situations that might lead to reactions. Uh, we help with interpretation of tests or identification of potentially offending foods. Uh, we can perform food challenges, aid in the development of targeted elimination diets along with the dietitian, and then educate uh, the patients. And with that, um, I'll close and uh, look for any questions you have. Great. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Dr. Atkins. It's a very informative uh, presentation. Um, Alex, do we have any questions out there? If you have any questions, please raise your hand for me or uh, type it in. Oh, we have a question from um, Joni Bosch. You're unmuted. Yeah, I was curious as to what we do with parents who have kids with autism who are asking about, oh, you know, I sent my blood off or my child's blood off to this lab and they said, oh, you're allergic to this, that, and the other thing. Um, do you have any suggestions as to how we defuse that situation? Right. Obviously, this happens a lot because, again, uh, we, we don't have a cure. And just like all of us, uh, the parents of these children are often looking for other potential cures. And if you go online, for example, <clears throat> you can read things that uh, certainly make sense. Uh, if you if you review oftentimes the uh, the mechanism behind or what's really going on from an immunologic standpoint, they're not particularly helpful. One that's commonly used is IgG antibodies to foods, and these are unfortunately not diagnostic of delayed allergic reactions. Um, but if you go online, you would think they are, and there are some practitioners who feel they are. Uh, but we all make IgG antibodies to the foods we eat, so it's really more of a marker of foods you've been eating rather than uh, things you're allergic to. So, you know, I usually I sit down with patients and we talk about, okay, this is the test, this is what it tells us, this is what it doesn't tell us. Um, but again, you know, sometimes patients then as a result of that are worried about certain foods and I don't, I don't usually stop there. Usually I talk to them about which foods they're concerned about and then we, we try the diet. For example, there are a lot of patients or parents who are concerned about exposure to milk or exposure to gluten and uh, they would like to try a milk-free, gluten-free diet. I, you know, to say that your child's not allergic uh, doesn't really help them. So what we really try to help them do is, is uh, you know, do it in a fashion where they can hopefully get usable uh, data and not be on a diet that uh, isn't nutritionally adequate. And so uh, that's an excellent question. It comes up a lot, and really it's usually by discussing uh, you know, the immune mechanism that's involved and why I don't think it might be as helpful in the information for that, uh, rather than just discounting it, you know, saying, oh, that's not helpful. Um, so. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, Susan Hyman has a question. I'm going to read it here. What is the cross-reactivity of soy and milk allergy? Um, the good news is there's no cross-reactivity between soy allergy and milk allergy. So a number of the kids who are milk allergic tolerate soy without a problem. If you're talking about IgE-mediated reactions to foods, I mean, it's been said that uh, about, you know, that a large number, I mean, I've, I've heard as high as only, uh, well, as high as 85% of people who are milk allergic might tolerate soy from an IgE-mediated standpoint, but that's usually pretty high. Um, from a non-IgE-mediated mechanism. So, so again, you just have to, if they're milk allergic, you have to look and see if they have a negative skin test to soy, they might well tolerate soy and that might be very helpful. Um, but if they're having primarily gastrointestinal symptoms, a number of the kids who have gastrointestinal symptoms alone and non-IG mediated food allergy uh, to milk or soy will react to the other one. And so, you know, and it's more than 50%. So in that group, you need to be careful. But in, in the ones who can tolerate it, it provides another exposure, you know, another good protein source that's widely available and relatively cheap, you know. So 
um, that's the correlation between soy and milk. Great. So another question we have from Tracy McKinney. Um, if you're diagnosed with nut allergies as a child but never had an EpiPen, do you have to go back to the allergist to get a prescription for an EpiPen? Well, <clears throat> it would be... Um, it'd be good to go back and, and touch base with an allergist because it might be interesting to have skin testing repeated and see if your skin test size has changed over time. Um, although most people don't outgrow sensitivity to tree nuts, um, you know, I do see people who uh, whose skin test is smaller and we check immunocaps as well and if their immunocap is below a certain level, uh, in some situations we've done food challenges and been able to get, you know, uh, foods back into the diet that someone thought they were allergic to. So, um, you know, I think it's a good idea to touch base with an allergist from time to time because things in regard to food allergy change. Um, the other issue is with any uh, significant allergic reaction to a food, uh, you could potentially have a severe reaction. It depends upon dose and, uh, and your level of sensitivity. So if there's, you know, if there's concern, uh, having an auto-injectable uh, epinephrine device is important. So that's why it might be good to go back, kind of run through with an allergist has been a number of years and see if anything has changed or if you still need to carry a uh, device. Great. And this is a um, question that might be applicable to our audience from Lori DeVoe. DeVo. Um, what do you do if you have a child who is almost allergic to everything, trees, grass, all foods except wheat, um, and allergic to soy, nuts, small al allergy to yeast? How do you handle these allergies, and is immunotherapy helpful? Okay. Um, well, there are a couple of things there. We do see a number of kids, particularly kids with eczema, who are sensitized to a large number of foods. Um, and in kids with eczema in particular, you need to be careful because they may have a lot of positive skin tested foods but eat a number of those foods without a problem. And so one thing is uh, to be careful when everything turns up positive. Uh, sometimes it's because of pressure-sensitive skin. If you're talking about skin testing, uh, sometimes it can be because of sensitization, because you have eczema and you make lots of IgE antibody, but you might still not be allergic. You might be sensitized and not allergic. There are children who are allergic to a large number of foods and environmental allergens, and we're back to that atopic march I talked about. Um, but, you know, in, in almost all instances, we're able to work up a diet that looks a lot like other people's diet <clears throat> that meets their nutritional requirements. And this is where you know, appropriate testing and working with the dietitian, uh, you know, becomes incredibly important to make sure that we're getting everything in and they're gaining weight and, um, you know, getting all the nutrients they need. Um, so uh, there are a number of children who are multiply food sensitized, and they can be uh, quite challenging from a clinical standpoint. But in most situations, either with the use of elemental formula um, or other, other sources, we can find a diet that the child tolerates. Excellent. So I think um, we have a, we're kind of running out of time, but this is a great question. So let's go ahead with that, um, if that's okay. We have um, a question from Ann Neumeyer. Oral hypersensitivity syndrome. I have patients complaining of tingling with kiwi or cantaloupe ingestion. Would this be oral hypersensitivity? Um, well, it'd be interesting to know. I mean, uh, the uh, cantaloupe, the melons and banana um, are the ones that cross-react with ragweed. So in patients who are ragweed allergic, they'll complain of oropharyngeal tingling and burning uh, with the ingestion of melons. And so that could well be uh, what's going on in those patients. And it'd be interesting to have them see an allergist and get skin tested and kind of go through what to do. Um, oftentimes, the patients don't anaphylax because those allergens are denatured uh, quickly in the stomach and they're not absorbed in large amounts. Uh, to cause anaphylaxis. Uh, so, uh, and the kiwi, um, I'm blanking on the cross-reactivity. You can see it with latex, but there are other things that kiwi cross-reacts with as well. Um, so uh, that's an interesting point, and, it, and they could well have oral allergy syndrome. The other thing I'd like to mention in regard to kids on the <clears throat> spectrum is that you think about skin testing and you worry they're not going to be able to tolerate it. And I've been amazed that, uh, you know, some of these kids obviously can't, and, you know, we move then to allergen-specific IgE in, in the blood. Uh, but I, I think it's worth a try because I have an, a number of kids that we've skin tested, and it really hasn't been a problem at all once it was explained and uh, went through, you know, went through what we were going to do and, and show them. So, and the other thing I would mention is that, again, these kids deserve the same workups as anybody else. 
uh, with allergies or food allergies, and oftentimes their expression of symptoms is different than your average child. And so, uh, you know, food aversion may be the presentation, or unusual posturing with, uh, you know, esophageal spasm or pain or things like that. So, uh, I think it's important to evaluate these children uh, just the way you would any anyone else, uh, but taking into consideration uh, their particular behavioral issues. So. Wonderful. Well, I don't see any more questions. Great. I want to thank uh, Dr. Atkins again. This has been a, a very informative uh, presentation, and uh, the questions have been wonderful and, and very on target for the uh, patients that we serve on the spectrum. So I'm very pleased that you were able to address all of those today. Well, I appreciate the opportunity to present. It's, it's a pleasure. If I can be helpful in any other way, please let me know. We sure will. So uh, thanks again, and uh, thanks to everyone who logged in today. And